Yeah. Okay. So like the prelude has like a bunch of modules that we should all know about. So I kind of grouped them in reasonable order. And so subsequent ones depend on the previous ones. Um, so the prelude is relatively small, uh, but there's still a lot of other modules that we should know about beyond the prelude. So we'd like to, I'd like to get to, the, get to those eventually too. Um, right. So m most of what's in the prelude, I believe, is like type classes stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll be talking about type classes. So if you're not aware with, uh, aware about what type classes are, um, this will be kind of hard to follow. I'm, I don't know if I want to explain type classes. I'm not prepared to explain those in this <laughs> introduction. Um, but right, so uh, in order to be valuable to uh, newcomers to these modules and concepts, um, I kind of came up with like a structure we can kind of follow. So uh, it's pretty reasonable. You just define the module, um, explain like when you want to, like when, uh, when, when this is a useful module to reach for, and then some examples, some basic examples, and then examples of like this module's instances, uh, this concept's in instances in PureScript ecosystem. And then of course, I'm gonna miss stuff, of course. So I, I hope <laughs> some people in the audience can uh, suggest improvements to this explanation. Right. Um, right, so let's start with the eek type class because this is pretty basic. Um, the eek type class is, uh, like if, if a data type has an instance of the eek type class, then uh, that means that it has a way of comparing uh, instances of this type. Um, and of course that's super useful. Like lots of, lot, like every language has some concept of um, knowing whether two values are equal. Um, I think like Java it has like some interesting way of doing like hashes of values, um, but um, in pure script, um, each type defines its own uh, uh, defines an instance of eek and then implements that. Um, yeah, so when when to reach for it, like whenever we want to know when values are equal or not. Yeah, um, and actually. Pure script, I wonder if I have the tab here. Yeah, this is the pure script docs. Um, and pure script can automatically derive instances of a few classes. And eek is one of those classes. So there's almost no reason not to derive an instance of eek. Unless, uh, you know, there's a, of course there'll be a slight performance cost to having the instance of, uh, to having the compiler derive an instance of eek for you. but wherever it makes sense, like just derive an instance of eek. Um, right, so for basic examples, like just integer, like one equals one, it's true. Uh, yeah, this equals is an alias for the eq function, um, which is, I wonder if I can, I, sh I should actually just bring this up in the prelude docs. Um, I like to, I like to look at pure script source code. So if you if you make a instance of a data type, you implement the eek function, um, where you can tell us uh, whether two instances of your of your type are the same are equal or equal or not. Um, yeah, so uh, integer has that, boolean has it, um, arrays, uh, uh, records don't. <laughs> because records uh, can't have instances of type classes, but you can compare records for equivalence if you make a new type around them. And um, then you can derive the instance of eek, like PeerScript could do for you. And then you can compare uh, two instances of uh, that type. Um, pretty basic. Um, and then like useful examples in PeerScript libraries, um, like tuple, either, and maybe are pretty common beginner friendly types. Um, so y you can take a tuple of one, two, and then a tuple of one, two, and compare them to be equal. Um, and it works as you expect, right? <laughs> um, if you do a just equal to a maybe, that returns a false, of course, pretty basic stuff. Um, and then so that, that, that's a basic data structure. More complex data structures, it works also, um, like a string map. It's like a, yeah, you can make 
a string map and another, another string map. And as long as all, all the keys and the values are the same, then those two string maps are equal. Um, and then like more, more practical, you know, you can construct P, uh, CSS rules in PureScript using a CSS library. So uh, if you, it, like if you construct two different CSS style sheets, two different CSS rules, you can, you can compare them for equivalence, uh, which can be pretty powerful. Um, yeah, so this works with any, any data type, any data structure, um, as long as you can uh, uh, drive an instance of eek for it. Um, so there's nothing, in, I, I, I don't know if maybe people in the audience can tell me if there's something more clever usages of eek that I've missed. I, I, I guess there isn't. <laughs> Uh, I've used it before, um, kind of wrongly, but with product types where I have multiple arguments, and then I wanted to have an eek instance that had equality between uh, arguments in different orders. So in that case, I had to manually do it. But maybe that's also not the greatest uh, modeling ever. Um, are you talking about... Let me see if I can bring up a text editor. So if you make a data type, uh, like a product type, right? Um, and it's got constructor one. Um, and then this has like an int and an, like multiple values, right? So if you derive an instance of eek for this, then this is worth mentioning that eek or pro, if you derive an instance of eek, then it first checks the first constructor for equality and then checks the next constructor for equality and the third constructor for equality. Um, so what was your situation for needing, for needing to derive an instance or your instance of eek? Uh, I was really naively modeling like the layout of an apartment. So if an apartment has like three parts to it, then it might like one of the components might be like a kitchen, living room, or a bathroom. And so I was just like using multiple arguments with those, but it, it, it was a pretty silly demo, so <laughs> yeah. But um, what I was going to also say is that I think uh, a lot of people might also get a little bit confused because uh, equality in most languages is by reference. And so like, you know, it's not how equality works in a pure shared by default or like many other functional languages where like structural equality is preferred. It's kind of like the comparison of if you have two apples and they have the same color and size. For them, like for most people, and definitely in the case of like structural equality, like these two apples, apples are equivalent, but in like a traditional language, it's just going to check references and two unique apples are never going to be equal. So that's kind of worth keeping in mind. Well, except in the case of like Java, like you said, where it has like hash map magic or hash code magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose if you add like a unique ID to each of those Apple, to the Apple data type and then each apple you create has a unique ID, then each apple will be unique, not equal to another. Oh yeah, yeah. And then Wrightfold's uh, example right there, where he says that if you only want to compare the first thing on a type. Back and forth. Okay, it's better oh, now? Yeah, it's oh, fixed. Much better, wonderful. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Somebody was, uh, said that they were about to have an epileptic fit. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, thanks for mentioning. Um, right. And um, yeah, so like if you want to, um, also if you derive an instance of eek, that won't work if you only want to compare equality based on like one field in a product type. So like for this, if you only want to compare yeah. by the first element, yeah, then you can't derive eek. You have to make your own instance of eek and <laughs> just compare the very first element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good points. Um, thanks for bringing those up. Um, the next one that's worth mentioning is the ORD uh, type class. So ORD is a way to know whether one value of a type is greater than or less than another. Um, and this is always 
uh, useful if you want to like a sort like practical usages is sorting a list or um, yeah like sorting things like yeah it's useful in lots of different cases um, yeah so for or there's some uh, rules you need to follow if you want to make an instance of or for your type um, or is also a uh, type class you can derive. PureScript can uh, derive that for you, just using derive instance syntax. Um, right, but um, it's, uh, or is for types which have a total order, I believe, which is any type that has, uh, that you can like lay down each value on a line. Um, Right, so like the, like the natural integers, like yeah, natural numbers, integers are like a total order because one, like one number is always greater than or less than another one. Um, yeah, and of course you can, uh, you know, compare for uh, greater than or less than for like almost, like, like for lots of different types. Like Boolean, there's only two values, so true is greater than false. Um, that's just the meaning that we've, placed onto it. And arrays, uh, you can compare arrays to um, the letter A is less than the letter B. Um, an empty array is equal to an empty array, um, right? So it looks at the elements inside of an array and compares each of those from uh, left to right, perhaps. Should you explain like DLTGT, you know, that's what it returns? Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, so the, yeah, the, the ORD type class, um, you need to look for the actual source code for this. Make an instance of compare for your data type. So if you make, if you make a new data type, you uh, make an instance of eek, not eek, uh, ORD, and then you have to implement the compare. And instead of tell, um, um, telling us whether two values are equal, you tell us whether these two values are greater than, less than, or um, each other. And that either the ordering data type are the options you can use to return uh, less than, greater than, or EQ. Um, yeah, so in my examples here, this LT refers to less than, one is less than two, GT, true is greater than false, um, and like that. Um, if I do true compare to true, uh, that, that should return EQ. Um, I wonder if I have a PSCI session. One compared to one. Yeah, EQ. Um, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. And like before, uh, for records, um, the reason I choose these types is because these types are common in uh, the basic type, primitive types in JavaScript. So it's worth mentioning them for people familiar with JavaScript here. So for records, uh, you can't compare uh, a record to another record. And that's because records are like a structural type instead of like a nominal type. And you, you, type classes only work for nominal types. Um, but you can derive an instance of ORD for your, for your record. Um, ORD uh, requires your instance to also have an eek instance. So you need to drive eek first and you can drive ORD. Um, and then you can compare your two records. But uh, like before, if you want to have some interesting uh, ways of comparing whether a record is equal, if you only want to use one field um, of a record to decide whether it's less than or greater than, then you, need to, you can't derive it. You have to uh, implement that compare function on your own. And also, like, an, um, if you want to have a custom ordering for your record, you don't need to make a new type for it, but, and you can still uh, do ORD stuff to a record. And you can do that by using the comparing function, which is, uh, I think that's provided in, comparing, yeah, that's, this is provided in the prelude also. But with, with uh, comparing, you provide a function to map the non-ORD type into an ORD type, and then it, and then it does the uh, comparison using that new value. 
So a record doesn't have an ORD instance, um, but if you just use a function to get like the first field out of a record and then use that to compare records, then you don't need to make uh, a new type for this record, which can be pretty useful. Um, right. So that's that's the basics, and then for um, like for practical examples of this, um, I, I I didn't spend too much time, uh, but I did find the, you know, the tuple either, and maybe it performed as you expect. Um, so it, it, two two values inside of a tuple, it compares both of them, not just one, unless you define uh, unless you do like a comparing uh, first element of a tuple with another tuple, then you can do custom stuff there. Um, and then uh, for the either type, uh, right is greater than left always. Um, and then if it's right compared to right, then it compares the value inside. But if it's uh, just a right value compared with a left value, then right is always bigger. Um, and then maybe type is pretty commonly used and uh, nothing is always less than just, which is similar uh, to left always being uh, less than right. Yeah, pretty basic stuff, Ford. I think it's worth noting that, like, you usually just derive this, and you kind of don't ever care about how it actually orders a lot of things. Like, I usually end up using sets, and, like, whatever's inside of sets, I don't really care how they're ordered. I just want them to be ordered so that I can actually use sets, and I can have, like, an efficient way of, like, getting things out and putting things in or whatever and emerging sets or whatever. So yeah, I think it's worth mentioning that it's just like, you don't care how it's ordered. You just want the compiler to do it, to drive the ordering for you. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to explain the, like these laws. Like a lot of type classes in PureScript have laws that you uh, need to or should follow. Um, I'm not sure, like, because if you if you make a, an ORD instance for your type, um, like your code will work if your ORD instance doesn't follow these laws. But if you pass it to some ORD functions, maybe um, it won't work as expected. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure how to introduce, uh, uh, like, how to explain to newcomers about uh, the laws that these type classes have. Like, 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 Justin, like, how do you explain that to people? Uh, I mean, I usually don't even look at the laws, so I'm like the mm -hmm. most guilty person. Yeah, 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 yeah me too. <clears throat> but it's still, it's still important to consider because um, it's just good, good rules of thumb for, uh, I, may, maybe these laws are the strict explanation of uh, data that can be ordered, and this is this is going to naturally follow if you decide that your data can be ordered. Then it's not naturally going to follow these laws. It could be thought of like this. <laughs> um, yeah, let's move on to something else. I put the laws down here for your reading pleasure. Um, bounded type class. Um, there are some types that describe uh, values that have like a top value and a bottom value such as um, like Boolean, there's are, there are only two values and we decide that false is less than true. So we can also say that false is the bottom value and true is the top value. Um, and this works for lots of different types like int, like in, in a mathematical sense, there is no top value to int, but in a computational sense, like computers, um, their int type can be, it has an upper limit before you start getting weird results from math on larger ints. Or um, in, in JavaScript's uh, case, if you take the largest int and you add one to it, then it becomes like a negative number. This kind of rolls over. Yeah, so that's uh, what where bounded becomes pretty useful. Um, by, having a, by having the maximum int, Define in a place, then you can uh, prevent 
going over that top value. Like if you, if you, like if the new value is less, is like less than top and you're adding, like it, it provides tools for building on top of. Like bounded in itself um, isn't always uh, super useful, but it's an essential base on which to build more useful uh, abstractions. Um, like Wright Fold was mentioning that bounded enum is a type class, which builds on top of bounded. And bounded enum um, is actually pretty useful. It's used in the date time library to prevent uh, choosing values outside of uh, the, the date time range. Um, let's, go, let's, go, let's look, look, look at the source code for bounded. So if you, want, if you have a data type and you want to make an instance of bounded, then you just implement the top function and the bottom function, and you just provide the, uh, the value of your type that is going to be the top value and the ones that the bottom value. And um, so, for, so for example, like Boolean, top is just defined as being true. Uh, top int is whatever the maximum int of the runtime system is. Let's see what it is in JavaScript. It's just hard code to be this single value. I think this is like a 32-bit or 55-bit uh, integer, one, one, one of these numbers. Um, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Um, right, and we already went over a lot of different examples. Um, and, and once again, records, mm, you can't really do type classes for records, but uh, you can uh, you can get bounded for the bet. So if you have a record uh, that has a field int, you can populate, you can make an instance of this record with maximum int value. If you uh, um, make an, if you derive an instance of generic, and then there's a generic top function, which you can use to get a, uh, and th this works for more than records. You can do like lots of different data types. You can derive a, a, a instance of generic for lots of different data types. And so if, if you don't, if you, can't make an instance of bounded or you don't want to, then you can just make an instance of generic and um, use a generic way of getting the uh, bounded, bounded values. Um, and this, yeah, this for tuple either, maybe this works as you'd expect. You get the top uh, int. If you have a tuple of int, uh, you get the tuple of top, top, tuple bottom, bottom. It's, yeah, pretty self explanatory. Well, actually, it's pretty interesting. The top of an either is the right, and the bottom is the left, with the value in that left being the bottom of the data type. And that's similar for the maybe also. Top is a just value, and bottom is a nothing. Pretty interesting. And I, I, brought, I mentioned date time here, because um, date time is composed of a year, a month and a date, and each of these are um, right. So you, you you can get a like the maximum date that's allowable in the PureScript date time library, um, based on the primitives that it uses. Um, yeah. Any any other comments from the audience? <laughs> anything, anything that's super nice to know for? People, would it be Armageddon if we reach that year? Obviously, we'll all be dead. But say again. Will it be like you know um, when it was year two thousand and we all got scared? <laughs> like, <laughs> Computer programmers. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to year twenty-seven thousand, <laughs> and that'd be it. It's the end of pure script. Cool. The end is nine. <laughs> then we won't care there because we'll be dead. <laughs> I'm curious about that. <laughs> leap seconds and whatnot. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how top and bottom applies to leap seconds. Um, it's bounded. And let's see the last one. This is a fun one. Semi group. Yeah, so those, those other type classes are pretty basic. Semi group um, starts the basis of. Uh, it, 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 builds, it, it, it uh, summarizes the idea of if I have uh, a type, I have two values of these types, this type, and I want to smush them together into a single type. 
um, then semigroup um, gives you an operation to do that. The operation in semigroup is called append. And this works for any type. If you have two instances of that type, two values, you, you define some way of smooshing them together in a way that makes sense. And semigroup is an interesting name, I thought. Uh, it comes from uh, mathematics, which you could probably guess. Um, but it comes from the idea that it's a group, but it doesn't use all the uh, operations, all the laws of a group. If you look at the definition of a, of a group, um, like the, a group need ex, a group expects uh, uh, like associativity and identity element, and a way to to modify a value, smush the value, smush the value into a value, and then undo that operation. Um, so that that's like a group. Um, hey, Alex, I have a question. Yeah. I mm -hmm. thought that um, the difference between a monoid and a semi-group was uh, a monoid does have the identity law, uh, but a semi-group doesn't necessarily have to have the identity law hold. Justin, you thumbs up? <laughs> Is that yes, right? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, a monoid does definitely have to have like an identity element, and but those it's... are quite useful when you are dealing with monoids. But one really good example is like if you're dealing with non-empty lists, then those don't have a neutral element. So those must be uh, semi-groups when you're using them in like whatever methods you're trying to use them in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the identity element you're talking about in monoid is the, the empty element. And monoid is a semi-group, but built on top by yeah. um, you have right. to be able to produce an empty element, and this empty element behaves in a way that if you combine the empty element with any other elements in that type, then it's effectively a no-op. Like nothing happens to that non-empty element. Mm -hmm. and that, yeah, that's that. That's the extra piece of um, usefulness that monoid adds on. But there's right. a, a lot of types that. Are, so you you think that oh, like everything's a monoid. Like, no, no, there's, there's types that don't have an empty element. Like Justin was saying, non-empty list. <laughs> like, a, like a list has an, has an empty list. So you can say that like an empty list is the empty element. Um, mm -hmm. But there's, it's, it's often more useful to presume that there is no empty element. Um, and that, 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 that's where non-empty list comes from. So non-empty list is a semi-group, but not a monoid. Um, yeah. So yeah, like 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 I said, there semigroup uh, defines the semantics of when you smush two types together. Um, but the one thing it doesn't have is the idea of the empty element. That's the monoid. Um, yeah, so I guess it's worth pointing out the expected behavior of semigroup append operation is. Um, it doesn't matter in which order you apply this to multiple multiple values. So like if you apply it to X and Y first and then put then, then smush Z into it, that's the same as smushing Y and Z first and then smushing X into that. Um, this is a pretty important law. Um, one Notably one law that isn't in here is uh, commuti commutativity, which is if you smush X um, on the left into Y, that doesn't have to be the same as smushing y into x. I believe, like, I believe that, that that's not a required uh, attribute of semigroup. Um, I think there's a pure script algebra library, which adds that expected behavior onto a type that builds on top of semigroup. I think it's called commutative semigroup. So if you do want that behavior, you can add that on by making an instance of commutative semigroup. Um, but yeah, that's outside, outside the scope of this topic. Yeah, so like if you look at math, it's called a dot operator, but in Prelude, um, in, we call it this triangle, triangle, <laughs> append. Diamond. A diamond operator? Yeah, it's a diamond. Yeah. A diamond operator. I just give up trying to guess what the names of some of these things are, Justin. <laughs> because when it, when it comes to like a dollar sign inside of there, like what do you call that? 
uh, Hala for a dollar. And I would. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's totally it. Honestly, go look it up. Hala for a dollar. <laughs> make, make a pull request, Justin. Make it official. Right. So, yeah. like, wait, like, when do you want to use a semi-group? Uh, is like anytime you want to com- like if you have a type and you find yourself wanting to combine two values of this type. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, I mean, well, we yeah, end up using them like all the time, right? I mean, you use, especially for strings, you yeah, use them strings. for like lists. Uh, if you have like streams or behaviors, you can also merge them together. Just, there's just so many uses of semi group. I especially like the one where you use it for uh, doing validations. So like the left side error message, like if there's ever an error, then you want to get all the errors like collected together and then get those presented to you. So in that case, like, yeah. That was the either those getting smushed together is super nice. Uh, it's usually through like accept or something that is exposed. Mm-hmm. Like a yeah, like an accept of like non-empty list, and then your actual result. Remember, there used to be two type aliases. There used to be the plus plus, and I'm I'm glad to see that that was taken out. Actually, is that what it is in Haskell? Uh, yeah, but uh, Prelude up and uh, let's see, uh, PureScript up until version seven, I think was was also supporting the double plus. Yeah. Yeah. In Haskell's case, I thought it was specifically typed to lists. I'm not sure. Mm. Is list okay? Yeah, someone's commenting in the chat. <laughs> yeah, I can't keep track of the chat. List I hope you guys interrupt with more helpful bits from the chat. <laughs> Somebody who says one of the type fighter or one of the operators can be called a type a tie fighter. Is that the one with the, with the dollar sign in it? Tie fighter is the one for a pen uh, or apply. Oh, oh yes, that's a tie bomber. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So, like, I'll, I'll use my uh, REPL here to give some examples of some really common. Um, semi-group operations. Um, actually, a string is, is, a, is a semi-group, but it, it's also a, a monoid also, um, which means you can do an empty element. Is it M empty? Right. Oh, you know but, that the hollow dollar, <laughs> it, it is a map. Just I, I couldn't let it go. Hollow dollars a map. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, right. So a string can do it. Lists or arrays can do it. Um, you can smush two lists uh, arrays together into a, a new single array. Um, what else do I have down here? Oh, I guess I gave a more interesting example. Uh, the set of uh, let's see, let's see, integers are in, yeah, integers are a semi group. Like one combined with two, um, because if you take one integer and push it into another integer, you can produce a new integer. Um, but like, what operation do you apply to get that new integer? You can do addition or multiplication. So if you just try and do two integers, it doesn't work. But if you, what is it called? Data.monoid.additive. Additive one smushed with additive two. And yeah, so integers are a semi-group over a certain operation. So to choose the operation on which you want to smush integers together, append integers, um, there are new type wrappers around those uh, to give those operations in. And like yeah, a more advanced example is that functions are actually a semi-group also. 
um, as long as it's functions on the same type. So like here I wrote like A to B, um, compose of B to C. Like the compose operation is the semigroup for functions, but only if it's A to A, composed with A to A, composed with A to A. Um, right, so here's an example where if we have a data type um, and we have two functions that you know, changes from one value to another value, uh, we can compose those two functions to uh, make a new function. Well, actually that's composing. I should have uh, used that monoid operator. Um, Do you wanna like give some super, oh yeah, some just easy examples of compose? Because I guess that's just been introduced, isn't it? Right. Of how compose kind of works, I guess. It's, you just pass values along, don't you? Essentially, so you, you can have multiple functions uh, and you can use them like in a row, I guess, would be the easiest way to explain it, couldn't you? So you could have like an add, a time, and a minus, and then you just you pass a number at the very beginning, and then it'll just go through add, times, then minus. Uh, that's a twisted way, but you can probably demonstrate something better. This is a semi groupoid, not semi group. Which one? Well, semi groupoid. The uh, compose the compose operation. Yeah. Right. Um, but semi semi groupoid is semi group on functions does something different. It applies both functions to the input and then and then appends the results. Uh, semi groupoid is for going across types, isn't it? Yeah, it's a category without an identity. Right, um, but if we restrict it to inside of a single type, functions on a type. Um, yeah, on a single type, then uh, they would be, uh, then composition would be append. So if right. you have a function from A to A. Right, so the, the way that you And this that, is called uh, endo in the uh, library. Right, you, you have to wrap the, uh, you know, A to A function in endo, and then you can do uh, semi-group append. And then this right. will translate to be the compose operator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not terribly uh, simple and therefore practical, but it's still useful to know about this kind of um, interesting property. Right, um, so uh, it, yeah, it's, it's uh, all right, I'll type it down here to be extra clear. So here, A and B and C are different types. Um, and then if you compose these two functions together, then you can get A to C. But if they're all the same type, then you can um, you can you can compose these using the monoid or using the semigroup append operation. Um, yeah, so this, this is an important difference. Um, yeah, getting a little bit out of my depth, but it's still pretty neat, and uh, it might come up at some in some time time to time. Um, yeah, so then to get get more uh, practical, actually using it with uh, simple like data types. Uh, I showed some with uh, array and string, but with, it works with tuple also. So if you have a tuple uh, string string and you use the append operation, it, uh, you get a new tuple back and the uh, things inside the tuple have been semi-group appended. So, this depend so the append operation for tuple will only succeed if the things inside the tuple also have semi-group instances. Um, I believe that's the same, no, and, and that, that, so that, that's for tuple, but either and maybe have different behaviors here. Um, if you semi-group append a maybe val uh, an either value to another either value, then it will, uh, if it's a right and a right value, it will do a uh, semi-group append on those values. Let me paste this into a, uh, REPL to show you interactively. So if you have two right values, import 
do that, that either. Um, either string string. If you have two right values, then it will semi-group append uh, the value contained within that either. Um, but if there's a left value, then it just returns le the left value. And if there's multiple left values, it only returns the very first left value. So I find this quite interesting because either uh, either has is a bifunctor, it has like two values in it, tuple has two values in it, where but the semigroup append operation is quite different between these two data structures. Um, and the way you can explain this for um, either is that either encodes the additional value, uh, the additional idea into a tuple that the left is an error. So for any type of operations, like binary operations on either values, if you take an either value and an either value, if there's any you know, error in those types, then it just kind of bails early, it jumps out early of those operations. Um, right, so I think that's really interesting. That, 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 that's, that's how either works. Um, I have a question about either. So yeah. either is a sum type, right? Uh, whereas a tuple is a product type. Is that, is yeah. my understanding correct? Please. So I was wondering about your explanation yeah, you're right. there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I think it defaults for left because it is a sum type, right? So there can only be one value. Whereas with tuples, it's a product yeah. type, so there can be two values mm -hmm. or more, right? And that's why you can, uh, uh, concatenate them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an important distinction I was uh, missing. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Sure. A tuple will always have two values, but the either is, is it's a sum type. So you, you choose between which value is chosen. Um, so the append operation is always going to have this idea of choosing one of the values. Right. But the interesting thing, I mean, let's see, let's go back to my left um, here. Like one possible implementation of this would be just return the left and semigroup append the values inside those two lefts. But that, that's not the behavior of left here. Um, so I'm, I, I've always been curious about if this is decided by some like mathematical uh, behavior, if this is modeled on top of some mathematical structure, or if this is purely for the convenience of programming. I think, um, as you mentioned earlier, right, it immediately falls out. The minute it detects a left, right, then none of the uh, additional operations are executed, right? Uh, just like map, if, if map encounters a left, then uh, you know, none of the other maps that follow it in that particular block of code would be executed. It just, it just picks up the first error, for example. Left is usually typically for error. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what's going on here is, is that you've got the minute it detects a left, then this append operation or concatenate operation is never even executed. It just bails. Yeah. 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 Like all, all of the um, type class instances for either like behavior yeah, on the, on the left. That's right. Like, like the bind operation is the same also. It just mm -hmm. bails early. Map, map right. operation, it just ignores the left value. So yep. you, want to map, you want to map a function on the success value. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, right. So it's a little complicated here. Um, it, like these might not be intuitive to a complete newcomer to these data types. So I think it was worth us <laughs> spending some time to explore them. Um, and then some other useful um, situations in the peer script library ecosystem uh, is the like the options data type, the options library, which provides some interface to provide a, a better way of constructing um, options objects that are passed to JavaScript libraries. It's kind of a common idiom in JavaScript libraries to have one function that uh, does everything, <laughs> and then you change its behavior by passing in options 
in a single JavaScript object. So this library provides a, like a pure script interface to constructing those options objects. So if, if you construct, uh, yeah, so con the options type has a semi-group instance, which means you can construct two separate options instances and then append them together into a single one. And that behaves as you'd expect. So if you have one options object that sets the, f the flag, flag to a value and another flag to ABC, um, if you append those and then render them, render them into a JavaScript options object, um, it turns them into a single options object. Um, pretty useful. Um, and it's, it's, it's useful to know about that, up, that append operation here. This library also provides some other means of adding flags into an options object, but this is one of them. You might like it. Um, and then for complicated data structures too. Um, if you have two different string maps, two different maps, uh, you can append them together and get one map. It does what you would expect. Mm. I guess that's, that, that's all I've got for the semi-group. Are there any, any other interesting uh, things about semi-group that we should discuss? Or, or maybe clarify, because I know I've made at least one mistake here. Or made it easy to misunderstand what I'm communicating. Mm. No, seems fine to me. OK. All right, so that's it for today then on this <laughs> series. Um, I'm not sure what to do for the next episode of the series. Um, I originally thought that we should do these in you know, somewhere in the series, but they're kind of complicated. Like we already kind of introduced the semi-groupoid, the function composition, um, but it's a little complicated. I'm not sure if uh, I'm able to explain all the nuances and motivations behind these. Um, yeah, so like next time we, we could do either these or we could do like um, semi rings and rings and stuff that are used for like numerics. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that's the plan for next time, one of, the, one of these two sections. Uh, if anybody wants to help with this for next time, much, much appreciated. Um, yeah, otherwise. If we want to help, um, I guess maybe through your GitHub uh, repository, right? We can just monitor that and any changes that you make, we can just, uh, yeah. is, that how you, is that how you'd like to do it? Yeah, and as far as the, uh, what happens with the information in this repository, uh, we could just keep it here, or we could copy and paste it into the, into the Prelude library itself, or mm -hmm. into the modules, the source code modules, so that these docs appear on Pursuit, or so that they're more immediately found when people are trying to figure out how these modules work. Um, right. Yeah, but like this is a good like place to draft them initially and add more useful stuff to them before mm -hmm. we copy and paste them into the source code repo repositories. Yeah, I really liked your adding a lot of examples as well. That'd be nice. Um, yeah, yeah pursuit could probably, really use that for sure. Yeah, because when you're in pursuit, you know, you can sort of look at a pen or something like that. Just I don't know. Get, get a few more examples is good because then you can go, oh, okay, that's kind of how it works. That's mm -hmm. really, I like yeah, so if, like I, I, I try to find some useful examples here. Most of them fall back to maybe either in tuple. <laughs> but if you guys find some nice instances of these Prelude data types, uh, type classes, you should definitely send a pull request over here so that um, other people are aware of them. Okay. Cool. Um, cool. Yeah. So yeah, here's the, uh, I'll, 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 I'll be sure to paste it into the video if I upload it to. Um, yeah. So we can change topics now. Thanks a lot for your patience and going through this rather basic stuff, but I think it's pretty important. <laughs> It is. It's always nice to, to get an understanding of these things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well done. Yeah, thanks. I actually have never even read about Bounded, so definitely learned a lot of things today. Yeah, I wish we could find like a specific case where Bounded is the absolutely essential thing for a function to work, but it seems like it's a building block rather than a useful thing in itself. Uh, then, Justin, 
What are you talking about? Oh yeah, yeah, I can talk about my thing. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, just like go over just like foreign generics, like my, just like lightly going over my blog post and then uh, like a light intro to generic strap, I guess. Uh, let's see, should I share my screen? Yeah, Seeing half your face doesn't work. Uh, let's see. Well, someone shout out if I like need to miss anything in the chat. So, uh, yeah. So, what is it? Was it actually yesterday that I wrote this blog post? So, yeah, I wrote this blog post about uh, using Genex rep with four generics to drive like the. Uh, the generic instance and then actually write out the JSON serialization instances using the generic functions. So like, I don't know, this is like my favorite thing in PureScript. Like, I don't know, understand most of the advanced things, but this is definitely one of the most useful. Uh, let's see, I might as well just jump right into it, right? So we can define a new type of a record, like like this, right? Like new type simple records and, and simple record is the constructor name I use again and I define my record with the fields and I derive instance rep generic simple record and then generic simple record and then the underscore has to be there on the last one because that's the like the type variable that I'm going to use for representations in my instances and I'll like show that a little bit later. But yeah, once you have this, then you can instance like decode for decoding from JSON. And then so you you uh, make the code equal to generic decode, and this comes from foreign generics also, and you provide some options. So usually when you're dealing with like a new type of uh, record or like even just like normal types, you want to use unrefinable constructors, which will uh, basically take out the constructor tag name matching. So that, that does come in later, use later with some types and I'll show that. But for now, just like, yeah, unwrap single constructors is like super useful. So you might as well always use it. And the same thing for encode instance where you use the same settings if you want to have the round trip work and you just use the generic encode method. So once you add this, uh, like, uh, I ripped this out of my how to uh, repo. So I have like this test JSON method where I have the original, I test the round trip, and I have an input JSON text, and then I have the expected case and I try to match those. And then the library gives you decode JSON and encode, uh, encode JSON and stuff. So you can directly work with it. Uh, this decode JSON, why I'm composing with run except is that. Decode JSON will try all the uh, all of the possible candidates. So if you have a subtype, then you have like as many candidates as you do the actual constructors in the some type. So this will if if you're dealing with some types, it'll gather those up and then give those errors back to you in the non-empty list that's collected on the on the left side. And so if you run the exception, you get the either out. So uh, yeah, after that long explanation, this we finally use our simple record. And if we take the simple record, A1, B, B, and C true, then the expected output is that uh, the actual uh, round trip works. And then we can see that the output is down here where it's gonna be C is true, B is B, and A is one. And then for our input JSON string, they can actually parse it and then when we run the exception, we get the right of the simple record and whatnot. So the thing that I added uh, like over the last couple of weeks is this enum style sometimes. So oftentimes we're usually working with some kind of a, a field that has this enum style string, right? So it's like a string literal and you know like what it's gonna be or there's like a couple candidates that it's going to be and there's no like extra stuff that comes with it. There's no arguments. So because uh, we didn't have it yet, I decided to write it. And 
it doesn't use the normal encoding uh, functions. It just gives you the separate functions, generic decode and generic decode enum and generic encode enum. And you do have one thing that you have as options, and it's just the constructor tag transform. So when you get like your input string, you want to be able to do a transform on the constructor tag. So in this case, like for my fruit data type, I'm an apple constructor. So if I want to match to an all caps uh, string that comes in, then I need to like make my constructor tag all caps and to provide a do upper. So that's why we have this uh, argument and yeah, the formatting is not so good. But yeah, uh, using that, like just like above, if you pass an apple, it will do the conversion. If you pass in a watermelon, then it'll read this, the string and then give you back the actual result. So it's not like super fancy, but at least it's quite common. Uh, and then and then I'm gonna cover the normal sometimes, I guess. So if you do have sometimes where the constructors have arguments, then most commonly you would never have like a truly mixed uh, JSON structure. I mean, people work with JSON with their native languages, sure, but usually they don't throw you string littles and an object in the same thing, right? So if someone gives you the some, uh, some type of encoding, it's going to be in an object and it's going to have some kind of tag field or type field or whatever to specify which constructor should be used here. And it's going to have like values or contents or payload or whatever you call it. And that's going to have like the actual things that you work with, right? So the normal encoding that's, that's used here is the tag and contents. You can change this to options if you want, but uh, for this example, I just have this simple case. So yeah, it's just some type, it has the constructors and some of the constructor arguments associated with them. So in my examples, you can see that if I have like, say, uh, set and then count five, then it'll convert that over here into a tag set and then contents count five, and then it can convert that back from JSON to whatever. Uh, and then the other thing is like, we have this null, and, null or undefined constructor. It's kind of ugly because the name is long, but the idea being that encoding maybes has always been just like super hairy and uh, ESOM. And there's like a billion complaints about it all the time about like how it handles like nulls or undefines or whatever. So in foreign generics, we just have this null or undefined constructor or null or undefined type. And it's a new type over maybe. So you do end up working with the underlying maybe representation, but at least for the uh, encoding stuff, you just get this uh, new type. And I mean, you can just use this as is, or you can, if you're really bothered by it, you can translate it over and just grab the inner maybe to work with. But yeah, I mean, so if you have uh, fields that are missing, then those will be, uh, those will not be written out because you know when you stringify undefined, it doesn't get represented in JSON because undefined isn't a valid JSON value. But if you have like a null coming in, then it'll properly process that to a uh, null or undefined of uh, nothing. And if you do have a value there, then it'll properly read it back as just not, just the value or null or undefined of just the value. And yeah, that's actually about it. Like, it's just, uh, I don't know. Yeah, like, like I said, it's like my favorite thing ever. And it lets you not have to write manual parsers for anything. Hey, Justin, quick, quick question about that last part. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about how the null and undefined stuff works. Do you also have a new type wrapper for a null and a separate one for undefined? Uh, <laughs> We used to, and then Phil took them out because they <laughs> found that like a lot of people never use them, like including me, I never use them. But if you do want them, then you could just just uh, open an issue talking about it. But uh, what we found is that if you do want to work with specifically null or undefined, then usually you want to work with the actual 
foreign library to manually write out the stuff because mm. it's kind of hairy. So um, um, this uh, if there's a JSON string that comes that comes into this function, um, and and you're trying to parse it into a null or undefined field. Like like the the presence of a tag with the value. Okay, you said undefined is not a valid value in JSON, right? Yeah, so it won't be there. But if there's a null, then it will be parsed to null or undefined nothing. Okay, okay. So if if the tag is missing, it's parsed as undefined, which that still fits in the null or undefined umbrella. Yeah, which is still like nothing. And if the tag is there but with a null value, it still is null or undefined, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's that's so, really nice. That's incredible, J Justin. Yeah, I, I mean, I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but it's it's obviously Phil's idea. I only came in to use it. But um, so actually, with Brightfold's question, I don't really know what happens with this encoding. Like, it does. I think the difference has been that it does correctly wrap the new types. So you get like null undefined of just of under null or undefined of just a value int. And then in the case it's not there, then you just get null undefined of nothing. But I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. But yeah, this is like the classic like ESON troll question if you wanna <laughs> make Haskellers mad. <laughs> I mean, other otherwise you could talk about like parcel functions and prelude, and they get mad about that too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, can you, so can you, uh, talk about um, how you implemented this. Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm so, curious about how, like, right there, you say like derive instance generic, right? Is a generics rep. Um, but I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what that does. And if you know, I'd be. I'd be happy. I'd love to hear like what that operation does. Uh, which part? The actual driving part, or yeah. just like about like the generic class? Mm, I guess maybe it's probably not important to know like what that thing does itself. But as far as like how to use a data type that has generic instance, yeah. Can, can, can uh, you show us that? Yeah. Sure. Um, so. Yeah, there's unfortunately not very many docs about it. And like I I learned generics by reading through like the uh, GC generics docs, which are really not useful, like super <laughs> confusing. But uh, the nice thing is that this is this uh, pure, pure script generics rep is based off of the GSC generics, but has a lot of like extra information by using like the actual constructors. So we don't have to parse through like as much metadata to try to figure out stuff. And it also helps that like PureScript actually has real records. So like you don't have to parse through like product types and like inspect the metadata to find out if there's a tag name on the product type uh, constituents. So yeah, um, the idea of generic is that you have this generic class and then there's always going to be these uh, methods. So you can convert from the spine representation to the actual physical type, and you can get go from the physical type to the representation. So uh, how do I explain this? It's like if you were somehow a magician and you had a fish and you could turn it into its bones, and then you turn it from its bones like a necromancer back into the fish. Maybe that's too stupid. But okay, so here, here there's a function to go. Uh, there's a two function or from function, and then the a. I I can understand that that's like a data type that I write, right? Yes, it's not the one I create. But then like the, the rep, like what is the, that? What does it look rep, like? So or the, the rep. What are the constructors for that type? The rep can be any one of like basically these types over here. So it can be like a field, a rec, an argument, constructor, some product, some, no arguments or no constructors. So that feels like a lot, but in reality, when you're dealing with like the top level type, you really can only have like the actual constructor at first, or sorry, you can have a constructor, a sum or a product in the very top level. 
because no, there's like no other types you can actually like represent in pure shape, right? With like data types. A new type will always be a thing that's a like constructor and then it has the argument inside of it. And uh, some type will always be a sum and the product type will always be this product. So there's like no other forms. Uh, then it also helps that there's this uh, functional dependency, right, of A to rep and rep to A. So once the compiler figures out one of these, it already automatically knows like the other one. So you never get into this like wild goose, goose chase where like the compiler like tells you like it can't figure out what the type is. So. Oh, so you're saying that um, there's all these different uh, constructors for the rep, right? Yeah. But we don't, we don't have to handle all of them. We only have to handle the ones that are used in the destination type, right? Yeah, and, and most importantly, whenever you actually have code that uses generics and you use the methods, only the actual types that are being used will be checked for their representations for uh, instances. So, like, that's actually a part of the trick that I did for implementing the enum types is that my enum types, there's only instances for like sum and constructor, right? Because I have to deal with the actual construction side of the types, and then I have to deal with the, the actual sum type uh, overall that's in the data type. So I don't have an instance for product or constructor or rec or anything else, really. And I also don't handle a case where the sum can have anything, any arguments inside, or I can have a argument inside the constructor because these have to be enums now, right? They can't have arguments to the data type. So by not having a, a instance for that, I also have to uh, like, well, restrict the actual usage. And well, I'll get into that example next. So the way that this is actually implemented is in the foreign generics library. If you want to look at the actual commit, it's quite short. Like how many lines is this? Uh, I can't read this because of the window. What? What? Where do you see? Uh, oh, right. Oops, I'm blind. <laughs> so there, there are 208 additions and 17 deletions, right? So you know that this like doesn't actually take that much work because even I did it. But um, if we want to scroll down to the part that actually matters, so this is just like part where I just added this functionality to an existing type. But here, this enum file, uh, I guess I have to move this. View. All right. So, like like before, like this, we have this construct tag transform option where you can like do two upper or two lower ID, and then the default option is ID because like like there's no other reasonable default we can provide. But the generic code decode, the generic decodes enum, is a uh, function where we map the two. So to the uh, decoding num options. So this means that like we decode from the string into our uh, representation or it's really just, it's really a, uh, an F, right? So it can, be, it can fail, but we decode from the string into the representation of our type. And like a necromancer, we turn these fish bones into the actual fish. Nice. And the uh, same thing happens for the generic inc encode sum. Well, in that it takes your actual uh, type, turns it to reps, and then using that reps, it encodes the thing. It encodes the rep into the JSON string that we want. And so I have uh, these type classes for actually like resolving and like matching on these uh, things. Um, I guess someone might also say that like, there's, this is supposed to be possible if you have like type families or something. But either way, I use type classes for this and we I have a generic code and generic encode. And then I have the specific instances. So this is where it's like actually useful, right? Uh, so in the case of the uh, sum types, I have the A and B. 
And I have to make sure that the A and B both have a generic representations where they can be uh, used for these operations. And I, I have to make sure that they actually do have instances of my type class. So in this case, I try encoding the left side. If it works, then I like make the in infix left constructor to get the rep and return it. And I use the alternate to say, you know, this doesn't work out, then try the right side. And I try the right side. And if it works, then I use the in right, infix right constructor, and then I return it. And then from here, the on, other only other valid uh, instance I have is that I match for this constructor, and the name has to be a symbol. Well, by definition, because this constructor name has to be like a static string. And then it needs to be no arguments. So it can't take any arguments or else it's not like an enum thing. And then from here, I just read in the string for the tag and I compare it to the constructor name. This constructor name I get by doing the constructor tag transform on the reflected symbol. So this is like, um, it sounds uh, magic, but it's literally only phantom types, right? It's just the symbol exists on the type level and we already, the compiler can already tell us how to like convert a type level symbol into the actual, uh, into an actual symbol, uh, into an actual string. And this is what like the point of the proxy says, right? So it's like a string proxy is that, it's just specifically a proxy for strings where it can then take the symbol and reflect it back down to the value level. So we do this matching and if it doesn't work, then we throw this uh, error and so that the next candidate can be tried or the actual exception can be uh, given back. And if it actually does work, then we pass back just this simple uh, representation. It's just a constructor of no arguments. And so from this actual representation, the compiler can go backwards and say, okay, we matched this. Now let's take this skeleton and type information that we have to convert it back into the actual value that we have, that we want to work with. And that's like generic strep in a nutshell. Like it's, it's really not much more than this. So it's just applied uh, phantom types, some type class stuff to resolve the types, which you might not need type classes for. And then, uh, yeah, I guess importantly enough-ish is that you need some way to convert from a type into a representation and a representation back to type. And a lot of languages obviously don't give you this like very easily, right? Like you usually have to do a lot of manual boilerplate yourself. But in languages like PureScript, Haskell, Scala with Shapeless, and a few others, then this is like possible. So. Yeah, it's just these three ideas and then poof, you get like magical automatically done code. Uh, and so moving on, uh, the other parts I have is just the parts where I have a fail constraint. So this is something that's, uh, it sounds like 10 or something, I think. Uh, it's just a neat way to say, okay, like I'm gonna use this constraint and all the constraint is is that it gets used in compile time to actually make this, uh, make any instances that match this crash the compilation process. And in this case, I just have the fail constraint and I provide a string, a symbol for the actual error message that's like generic encode, de in generic encode decoding enum cannot be used on types that are not sums of constructors with no arguments. So, uh, like I'm just like matching on all the uh, all the patterns of reps, reps that I don't want to support, right? So arguments that's out, that's like no, I can't do product types of any kind. It's out of here. And if I have uh, any constructors, I take products in. It's like ah, that doesn't work. It's like to be thrown out of here. And the same thing with rec records. Like you can't like. Uh, get a record argument for an enum, so that's out of here. Uh, the only sad thing is that uh, the only sad thing is that we don't have like a way to do uh, flexible comp uh, like correct flexible context or 
uh, like instance, uh, what is it called? Instance like routing or something. Uh, it's like in some open PR, but if we had that, then we could have like a base case that fails for all cases. But yeah, for now, this is like all we have for errors. I think probably someone commented about how this works. Uh, what, what, how do I get my chat room? Yes, instance chains. Yes, thank you. So if we had instance chains, then we could definitely do this. So at least this is like on my mind kind of that we need to come back to this and do that. But uh, yeah, the other cases are pretty much the same. Just uh, I can encode from the sum. I can encode the actual uh, tag to constructor name back, and I do the constructor tag transform, and then I build up the uh, build up the generic structure, and then or no, in this case actually from the generic structure, I just build up a string basically, and that's about it. Um, maybe this was more long-winded than it should have been, but like I just want to like show everyone that like generics are super cool and they're not they're not hard to do. Did you figure out a way to pull? I see you re repeated that string, that fail string. Yes. Several places. You didn't figure out a way to type synonym that. Uh, unfortunately, there was a bug in the compiler. Uh, <laughs> That didn't correctly resolve the uh, the synonyms, but I think let's see. Oh yeah, Liam actually already fixed it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's like some magic here, but yeah, he, it's it's like already fixed. So I guess the uh, next version of the compiler, I'll be able to at least replace all of those redundant strings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm waiting on uh, Redfold's PR to Argonaut generics to get in, and then I'll probably just like copy paste the same code for Argonaut generics. I mean, like right now, Argonaut generics uses uh, the old generics, which like I don't understand at all. So <laughs> I'm waiting until Redfold's PR that converts it to generics wrap comes in, and I can use my generics wrap approach. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's about it for me. Um, if you want to read more about the actual data type generics, I do have this blog post. So just data type generic programming for generic, generating TypeScript code. And this is where like, I went crazy and decided to generate TypeScript code from PureScript, which is like a bad idea, but I did anyways. <laughs> But yeah, um, yeah, and then the actual blog post is called Automatically Decoding JSON in Pure Script Using Generic Strap. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where I should even put these. Like, should I just post them on Slack or something? If anyone wants to see them, or I could just like post them in this chat room, rather. Um, um, yeah, post them in keep... Slack. I can copy and paste that into my notepad, and I'll add that to the video notes. There's a, oh, size limit. Still recording. There's a size limit to the video notes. Yeah, I'm, well, yeah. I can remove it if you don't want it. <laughs> no, it's fine, I think. I have the powers of editing. <laughs> Creeping on. Well, yeah, uh, thanks for listening to me ramble. Yeah, that's super interesting, uh, Justin. Thanks a lot for explaining how uh, this generic stuff works. It's going to be super helpful for writing some docs and help, helping other people. I really like the bit about the fishes. That's yeah, that's a good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> I was lost, and then the fish came in. And I was like, thanks. Back on track. Yeah. Oh, no. I feel like there should be a better one. There should be a better analogy out there. Oh, that's pretty good. That was good, fish. From <laughs> fish. Well, I don't know if we want to associate pure script with necromancy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, I was thinking more like Jesus or something. But okay. <laughs> hey, Justin. Um, yeah. A couple of days ago, I was trying to get that, like, using generics rep to pull record field names out of the record, and like it just failed miserably. Any ideas like about about anything like that? You probably got the most generics rep knowledge in general. 
right? No, I mean, definitely uh, at least Phil, right, told Liam, Gary, Nate, and I mean, your name a whole bunch of other people. Compiler, so that one was not fair. <laughs> hmm. Who doesn't work on a compiler and knows about Gen X, right? I don't know. You could ask any Haskeller. Oh, sorry, you can't because Haskeller sees pretty messed up generics. Um, yeah. So if you go to my repo that's called uh, awful PS generics to TS Jacogen, you'll see like some source examples here. And so how you work with uh, records is that you have to, you basically work with like a type class that you have and you work with the record. And the, the argument that it has is fields. So you want to make sure that these fields have like actual like instances and you can just like pass it through. And then once you pass it through, the, where do I have actual fields here? This is weird. Oh, here it is. So once you have that, you actually have the field. And the field, the first one is the symbol for what the field name is. And then you have A for whatever representation is or whatever physical type is inside of it. And then if you want to actually further inspect on it, then you have to offer, you have to uh, define some extra constraints on it. But yeah, this is about how it works if you want to work with fields. Yeah, I was looking at that. I was trying to see if there's a decent way to do like a shallow extraction. So you could like maybe take only the top layer field names for a record and then just get those out just using reflect symbol. But I didn't want to like bring in a whole bunch of type class stuff. I just wanted to do something simple. And I'm mm. getting the feeling that it's just not a simple problem. So. Well, I mean, you have to resolve like static type information somehow. So I don't know. I mean, is there a nicer way than type class in pure script at least? No, I don't think so. I just put it all in a stir map. So like I cheated. No, it's, that's actually like really cool. I actually really like string maps, like coerce it, string map of forms. Like, yeah, that's cool to me. Yeah, I actually didn't end up uh, coercing it. What I ended up doing is changing the data structure. So the JSON's deserializing an Argonaut to basically take a record and then just dump it in a string map. Um, and then if it's like nested, it'll just throw an error because that data should never be nested. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, that works too. Hmm. I, I, yeah. I, anything else we got to talk about? We could do, what else can we talk about? Or we could just end. <laughs> Uh, it is like midnight 40 for me. So probably sleep time in like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Night owl.